We are in 1st John chapter 2. We'll be looking at verses 26 through 29 this morning. But by way of introduction, let me just get right to the point. And this section is very clear. And we talked about this some last time as we met. Loved ones, it is the last hour. Our Lord is coming back. And our one and only hope is his glorious appearance, for he is near. The Lord Jesus Christ is soon to be revealed. And he will come just as he went, which was gloriously, majestically, with all authority and power and judgment and with every grace for those who are his. Every eye will behold him. And this is why, excuse me, this is why the time is now for all who confess him as Lord and Savior to separate from their love for this world system and to abide in him by faith. Now, there are many ways to describe this abiding, but really the most useful for us is that it simply means living with and living in Christ. To live in Christ means orienting our lives around him as we find him in his word, such that our entire lives become focused upon him, oriented to Christ, and we live for Christ by the power of Christ. Abiding in Christ is more than just uh, living in proximity to the activities of the church. It is living in union with him by faith. Now Paul the Apostle said, for me to live is Christ. Jesus had become everything to the Apostle Paul and such that he gave new meaning to every aspect of Paul's life. To live then means Jesus in us and we in him. And to die, to be absent from the body, is to be present with him where he is. So that whether we live or whether we die, we are in Christ. We abide in him. And that is the fundamental reality of the Christian. Living in Christ by faith, in union with him. Now please hear me this morning. We're going to talk about some very important things, but this is not about... Uh, perfectionism, being perfect. It's not about trying harder. Living in Christ is not about you pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. Abiding in Christ is not really a human achievement, nor is it some mystery to be figured out so that when you finally do unravel the mystery, you become some kind of super Christian. And loved ones, there are no super Christians. They're just Christians. Life in Christ is instead the life and the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you, granting you faith, sustaining your hope, teaching your mind and heart truth, and filling you with the expectation of one day seeing Christ with your own eyes. And listen, every Christian has the Holy Spirit. When was the last time you thought about that? That you, Christian, have the Holy Spirit. And even in your weakest moments, you're being sustained and kept and guarded by Him. The Holy Spirit is persevering you in your faith. And you are not here by accident this morning. There is a written word for you here in this passage to hold you up and to encourage you as you look to Christ and make him your all. Now, don't take my word for it. Let's look at what John has to say about these things. We are going to look at chapter 2, verses 26 through 29. But as these words are closely connected to the previous section, I think it is best we read from verse 18, which we talked about last time I preached. 
So 1 John 2, 18. John writes this. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not really of us, for if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would be shown that they all are not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. I've not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but the one who denies, saying, Jesus is not the Christ? Well, this is the Antichrist, the one who denies the Father and the Son. The one denying the, the Son neither has the Father. The one confessing the Son has the Father also. As for you, let that abide in you, which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise he has promised us, eternal life. And now verse 26. These things I have written to you concerning those who are trying to deceive you. As for you... The anointing which you receive from him abides in you, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. But as his anointing teaches you about all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, abide in him. Now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. May God richly bless the reading and the preaching of his word this morning. There are three major points to be taken from verses 26 through 29. The first of these is the effective cause of our abiding. The effective cause, which is the Holy Spirit. Second, there is the commanded response to the Spirit. The response to the Spirit, which is we are to abide in Christ. Third, there is the eternal purpose of our abiding. What is it for? which is that we may have confidence in Christ's return. So the cause, the response, and the purpose. First John tells us what the effective cause of our abiding is. Now in the previous verses, 18 through 25, which we just read, John clearly spells out for us how to spot an antichrist. That's an important skill to have these days. It's not a great mystery. An antichrist is simply someone who denies that Jesus is the Christ, denies that he is the Son of God, God in the flesh. And John tells us that many antichrists have appeared. And contrary to what we might expect, these don't just come from the secular world. The ones John is describing here used to be members of his church. They are religious people who though they have come to deny Jesus, they still believe that they are the ones who have a right relationship to God. It is they who point at the Christians and say, you paideia, you children, you spiritual infants, we have the knowledge of God. We have advanced, and it is we who know all the mysteries. You don't have the Father, we do. And, of course, the Antichrists not only spout their own wisdom, they always want to be in charge. They want to be teachers 
and preachers and to be made much of for all their knowledge. Well, John's solution to this, as you may recall, is also kind of surprising. He does not provide an apologetic strategy against antichristism. Okay? He doesn't give any detailed arguments against their claims. Instead, he does two simple things. In verses 20 through 22 through 23, he reminds the Christians that to deny the Son is also to deny the Father. In other words, the Antichrists don't even have the Father, though they apparently insist that they do. And second, in verse 24 now, John simply tells his flock to stick with the gospel. In other words, to go back and to cling to what it is they had heard from the beginning of their faith. The gospel is what they need, actually. Now, why? I mean, after all, these, these antichrists who have left may be putting out some rather sophisticated-sounding arguments that are difficult to refute. We would probably want to counter with our own counter-arguments. But John insists on emphasizing the gospel message here. Now, the reason is, is because he's much less concerned with winning an argument against them, but as a pastor, he is much more concerned that his own spiritual children abide in the truth of Christ, notwithstanding what all these other people are saying, see? The issue of abiding is completely lost on the Antichrist. Not a one of them has a clue uh, as to what it is to live with Jesus. They can't know it, right? Because they have rejected the one and only thing by which a man can have union with Christ, which is the gospel of our salvation, the message about Jesus. Loved ones, it is only by hearing and believing the gospel that we come to know Jesus and his Father. And without the gospel, we have nothing. So John is keeping it very simple here. He, he has seen, as an apostle, he has seen the crucifixion of his Lord. He has seen the Lord's resurrection. His testimony about Jesus is flawless and trustworthy. And the faith of these little children is based upon his reliable eyewitness testimony to Jesus. And it is also based on careful study of the Old Testament. These little churches that John pastors are deeply rooted in the Word of God. The Antichrists have come along and they've blurred the gospel. They get a kick out of making a mystery out of what was intended to be clear and to be clearly spoken. See, you and I, loved ones, don't always need deep, sophisticated arguments as a first response to people. What we need is to know that we are united with Jesus by faith in his gospel. No gospel, no union. And if we're not united with him, we're not abiding in him. Now, beginning in verse 26, John begins to turn his attention away from the Antichrist and to this idea of abiding. In verse 26, he basically says, all right, I've written enough about those who are trying to deceive you. Now let's talk about what is true of you. Hey, Christians, paideia, simpletons, you intellectual infants. Again, that's what the Antichrists are saying about the flock. Here is your reality. Verse 27. Look with me there if you would. John says, The anointing which you received from him abides in you. And beloved, right here in these beautiful words is the effective cause of our abiding. The anointing which you received from him, from Jesus. And if you're like me, and I hope you are like me in this way, you know, too often our habit is to think that we must conjure up and summon our own powers of obedience in order to accomplish this abiding. It's, 
ingrained in us that we must somehow find that anointing oil for ourselves so that we might more effectively pull off this Christian life. We look at some Christians who, who seem always to be on fire for the Lord, or if not on fire, just at peace, consistent in their walk, joyful in every situation. And we either think that there's no way we can accomplish that, so we just give up, or we dive right in with enthusiasm only to come up short in a few days and be totally disappointed in ourselves once again. We, we long to be endowed with spiritual power. Many of us are always chasing the next doctrinal trend in Christianity that will help us feel nearer to Jesus. But all the while, we forget that Jesus has come near to us. It's the whole point of the gospel. The anointing which you receive from him abides in you. First, note that we received this anointing. Keeping in mind now that the anointing is the Holy Spirit himself. And when we first believe the Lord Jesus, I want you to get this. If you got nothing else, I want you to sense this. When we first believed, the Lord Jesus anointed us with the Spirit. We didn't do this. We didn't earn it. We didn't appropriate it. Didn't take it for ourselves. No, we are helpless recipients of grace and we were given the Spirit as the gift He is. There was a point, loved ones, in your life, and you may not know exactly when this was, but there was a point in time when the Lord Jesus personally anointed you with His Spirit. And if you're perhaps thinking here about the Old Testament picture of pouring oil on someone's head to anoint, anoint them, like, like the prophet Samuel did when he anointed King David. You, you've got the picture right. Jesus has lavished us with the Spirit by immersing us in Him. And we are completely drenched. You may not feel drenched in the Holy Spirit, but it's something that Jesus has done. In Luke 3, the people have heard John the Baptist preach, and they're wondering where, whether he might be the Christ. You know your preaching is good when people start to wonder, are you him? But John instead points them to Jesus, and he says, for me, he says, as for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to untie the thong of his sandals he will baptize you. He will immerse you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Loved ones, if you are completely drenched in the Holy Spirit, how is it possible to need more? The Spirit is a gracious gift of our Savior and Lord. It's a gift that takes away all of our boasting. And it causes us to boast only in the giver. But I want you to also notice what verse 27 says. Not only did Jesus anoint you at a given point, but the effect of that anointing continues into this present time. John says, the anointing which you received from him abides. Present tense, continuous, ongoing in you. Right now, the oil of Christ's anointing remains upon you, Christian. As a matter of fact, it abides in you. The Holy Spirit lives in you. In John 14, 17, Jesus calls him the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. Now, I find it rather difficult to emphasize how important this is that we first see the effective cause of our own abiding. See, far too much of the time, you and I begin our day by going directly to the second step, directly to the command to abide in Christ. We wake up, go to work, I need to be in Christ. 
I needed to be God's man. And we take no thought for the gift of his spirit, which is already in us to help us and empower us. We just get it into our heads that it all depends upon us. I hope I'm not the only one who does that. But it's just another way of saying that we forget the good news of the gospel and we live as if Christianity were merely a law to be performed. So grace, we think, is for the beginning of the Christian life, but the rest is up to us. It gets so bad that we so far separate our justification from our sanctification that it's like we're living two religions at the same time. We get grace on Sunday. And the rest of the week is law and personal integrity and commitment. And we're disappointed and tired and weak and we too embarrassed to admit it. Now, of course, it's true that we are to to abide in him. We are commanded to do so. And we're going to look more deeply at that in a moment. But our abiding has an energizing, strengthening power behind it. And that power also has a truth content, which is the message which we heard from the beginning, the gospel of Jesus. Uh, What does John say back in 1 John chapter 2? What does John say in verse 24? Oh, there comes the rain. You have to fight now. You have to fight. Let the Holy Spirit energize you now. As for you, he writes, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. Vine Community Church. What is the effective cause of your abiding in Christ? Well, you need to ask it another way. What is it you heard at the very beginning of your faith? What was the message that brought you to faith? I'm going to ask you to turn uh, to Ephesians chapter 1. If you don't quite know where Ephesians is, you're in 1 John right now. Just go left until you hit it. Ephesians chapter 1. beginning in verse 13. I want you to see these words for yourself. The Apostle Paul is writing here, and he says, In him, that is, in Christ, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Paul is describing to us the very same thing that John is telling us in verse 27, which is we heard the gospel of our salvation, we believed, and we were sealed in the Spirit. But notice that this is not just past tense for Paul but that that he goes on to say of the Spirit, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance. Notice the present perfect tense there. Grammar is so important in the New Testament. The Spirit is given. He is right now still the guarantee of your inheritance. So, past tense anointing, present tense abiding. The Holy Spirit given in the past now present with us because he never leaves. He is the effective cause of your ability to abide in Christ. King David was deeply repentant, a great sinner, and deeply repentant when he wrote these words in Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Now we read those as terrifying words. 
It is likely that David means to say, do not take away from me my kingly anointed. Don't take away my kingdom. See, the Holy Spirit made David king. And David's terrible sins have put the entire nation of Israel in jeopardy. And it's for good reason that he pleads with God not to take his throne from him. But loved ones, this is a verse of Scripture. And that phrase, do not take your Holy Spirit from me, this is a verse of Holy Scripture that you and I never have to worry about coming true in our lives. Some of us live in fear of that verse, and you even pray it. But again, past tense anointing, present tense abiding. The Holy Spirit is a gift, and He is the effective cause of our abiding in Christ. The Holy Spirit has come to take up permanent residence in your life. Now, this effective cause has some very important characteristics. Notice in verse 27. Verse 27 is so key. John says, and you have no need for anyone to teach you. The, uh, the Christians to whom John writes really lack nothing with respect to their knowledge of the gospel. And they have no need for someone to come along and explain to them the deep mysteries of God. You'll remember that earlier we said that these antichrists want to be teachers and preachers. Some of them will even call themselves apostles and prophets. And they want an audience and they want to be in charge. They're the ones who say, the Lord appeared to me and gave me a word of knowledge. See, they spout new revelations from God and they will literally say, thus says the Lord, while, all the while, just speaking from their own minds their own thoughts. In other words, these antichrists who are bothering the churches in Ephesus will tell you that you need a teacher. You just need someone to teach you the deep mysteries of God. And they will say that your Christianity is not enough. Jesus is not enough. And if you reject them, they will accuse you of having a spirit of religion that is keeping you from experiencing the anointing. Well, why do the Christians not need someone to teach them? Look with me back in 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. Verse 20, John says, But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. Loved ones, the Holy Spirit teaches you all you need to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he teaches you through the word and not through esoteric mysteries, prophetic visions, and some kind of extra biblical anointing that is only for the super Christians. If someone comes along and tells you, you need to be taught by them, be very wary. Now, we need to be careful here. John is not saying that Christians don't need teachers at all. After all, John is teaching them in this letter, is he not? I'm up here attempting to preach the word of God. You and I need preachers. We need teachers. He's not saying that we don't need them at all. It is part of our sanctification and spiritual growth as Christians to submit ourselves to the teaching and preaching of the word. But have you ever known anyone to say, I don't need a preacher or a church, I just need my Bible and the Holy Spirit? Well, wrong. See, the Apostle Paul is quite clear in Ephesians 4 concerning the offices of the church. He says, and he gave Christ, he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So, beloved, we are to submit ourselves to the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. 
And to refuse to do so may mean that we don't even have the Spirit at all. But John in verse 27 now is making a a tight connection between anointing and knowing. And besides, what it is, what is it we know that the Antichrist can never give us? It is that which we heard from the beginning of our faith, the message concerning Jesus. The very message, by the way, that the Antichrists have rejected. The anointing is the Holy Spirit. But I need to say that the point of the Christian life is not the anointing itself. There are many, many people who constantly chase after an anointing. If they just could have the anointing, they could have whatever they want. Rather, the goal of the anointing is that we might abide in Christ. Many self-appointed prophets and apostles will reverse this, actually, and they'll say, well, yeah, it's good that you believe the gospel, but you have to go on to greater heights of knowledge. They will say that there's more to the Christian life, more visions, more prophecies, greater power, and that they will say that the anointing is there for the taken, for whoever wants more. But that's just a carrot on a stick. Look, the true anointing, as John is teaching here, is not meant for visions and prophecies and understanding all mysteries. It is meant for the simplicity of living in Jesus. Well, what else is characteristic of the Holy Spirit's ministry? Back in verse 27 again, but as his anointing teaches us about all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, abide in him. See, the Holy Spirit teaches you in a way that only he can. And he is the effective, true cause of your abiding. I'm trying to convey the, the close action of the Spirit as it relates to our abiding in Christ. And maybe I think close is not the right word. Perhaps immediate is a better term. What I mean is, whereas the Antichrist's hold out that carrot on a stick and tempt you to chase after an an anointing you will never achieve, the Holy Spirit already dwelling in you by faith always, always drives you immediately to Christ. And in Christ, Christian, is your rest and your peace. So the Holy Spirit is the effective cause of your abiding in Christ. Second is our commanded response to the Spirit, which is obvious. Abide in Christ. Verse 28, look with me there, please. Now, little children, abide in him. And I love that little adverb there in verse 28, now. Why is it so important? Because the abiding of verse 28 is made possible by the Spirit's abiding in verse 27. You cannot abide in Christ without the Spirit. In other words, now that these things are true in you, that we have received the Spirit, that we know what we need to know, now that the Spirit is true and what He teaches is true and is not a lie, all these things being so, now abide in Christ. Now you're ready. Now I can live in Christ because the Holy Spirit has raised me from the dead. Now I can rest in Christ. I can rest upon Christ because the Holy Spirit has settled it in my mind that Jesus is the sovereign Lord. Now I can make Christ my one and only treasure because the Holy Spirit directs the gaze of my heart to Christ's beauty and all-surpassing worth. It really is true that you can do nothing without the Holy Spirit. It is so important to know that your abiding in Christ is not really a feeling or an enthusiasm. It is not euphoria, although there will be moments of pure bliss and rapture as we follow Christ. 
But really it's more like a settled conviction in your heart and mind that Jesus is your Lord and Savior and that the only thing that really matters anymore is His glory in your life. That's where you're headed. That's the road. That is life with Christ. Well, mostly our abiding in Christ has to do with our close connection to the Word in our daily lives. In other words, how are we going to make this work? What does it come down to practically? I would encourage you also to turn to John's Gospel, chapter 15. You've got Matthew, you've got Mark, Luke, and then John, chapter 15, right in the middle of John's Gospel, verses 3 through 11. John 15, 3 through 11. And let's listen to Jesus' own words. Now, this passage is deserving of its own sermon series, and I'm not going to exegete the whole thing for you. We don't have time for that. But I would have you pay close attention to what Jesus says about our abiding as it relates to the Word. And I will try to emphasize that relation in my reading. Verse 3 of John chapter 15. Jesus says to the disciples, You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them, and they cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it would be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. And we said earlier that the Holy Spirit teaches you all you need to know about the Lord Jesus Christ, and he teaches you through the Word of God. And it comes down to this, loved ones, you cannot live in Christ effectively without living in the Bible consistently. Christ Jesus has given us a word to live on, to feed upon. And it includes not only the record of his spoken words, but also includes the words of his apostles, whom he directly commissioned and inspired. And it certainly includes all the writings of the Old Testament. To live in Christ means living in his word and obeying it, believing it and obeying it. Now, I realize that for some, just the idea of trying to read the Bible consistently sounds daunting and laborious. This is not necessarily a sermon on Bible reading. But listen, follow the logic here. The Holy Spirit's ministry in us is to turn our attention to the truth of Christ. The Holy Spirit brings us to a place of knowing. He teaches us Christ, and he does this only by directing our attention to the written word. Loved ones, there's nothing else for it. You and I must be diligent students of the Bible. After all, it is the word of God that the Holy Spirit breathed out, 2 Timothy Chapter 3, the Apostle Peter. This is such an amazing thing. The Apostle Peter, who was an eyewitness to Jesus' transfiguration on the Mount of Olives. You can read about that in Matthew 17. Peter does not even take that glorious event as the mainstay of his life. It was very important, but not the main thing. In 2 Peter 2, he writes this. So we have the prophetic word, made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this, that no prophecy of Scripture 
is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human men, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. See, even for Peter, who saw the most miraculous things during Jesus' ministry, he directs our gaze to the written word. Because it is the word that God has bequeathed to us to guide us into truth. So we have the Holy Spirit in us, and we have the word of God in our hands to direct our attention to Christ. And what is more? The Holy Spirit who lives in us is ready and willing and able to guide us into the truth through that word. What did Jesus himself say about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in you? John 14, 16 through 17, Jesus said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and in you. We read that a while ago. John 15, 26, Jesus says, When the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, that is the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify about me. John 16, Jesus says, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak. Now, Christians, you and I are commanded to abide in Christ. This is not a choice among other choices in the Christian life that we can just pick and choose. It's not an option among many other options. No, as surely as the Holy Spirit lives in us by the gift of Christ, so we are to live in Christ by faith. Truth is, Christian, if if the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, if you are a Christian, you will abide in Christ. Now let me ask you this morning. Do you live in Christ? Let me ask it in some other ways. What is the overall spiritual direction of your life? Are you being driven to the word of God more and more? Or are you easily kept away from it? Do you have an ongoing hunger to feed upon the truth of Jesus? Or are you more satisfied with other things? Is the Lord Jesus becoming more and more precious and all satisfying to your heart and mind? Or do you find yourself satisfied with less? Or are you always looking for more than Jesus? What is the overall pattern of obedience in your life? Do you long to follow Christ's commands and to glorify him with your character and your actions? What comes out of your mouth? Is it praise and trust in God or is it despair and complaining and whining? I could go on and on. The point is that every life has a pattern of character. And character is formed through the long years, either by the grace of God and his word, or by sin and the cares of this world. Do you live in Christ? Are you abiding in him? I suppose the most effective way to ask the question is, is the pattern of your life conforming more and more to your confession? If you confess faith in Christ, is it an observable fact in your life that you are abiding in him? And if not, why not? Perhaps you're here this morning, you don't even know Christ. You're trying to latch on to what I'm talking about, this living in Jesus, but you have no, you have no context for it. Well, you need to go back to the beginning. To what will have been the beginning of your faith. You need to hear the gospel. You need to hear the good news that Jesus is the Son of God, God in the flesh, and that he has died on Calvary as a sacrifice for sinners, just like you and me. 
You need to hear that he rose from the dead and is even now reigning and ruling and is soon to return in judgment. You need to begin there. Loved ones, live in Christ. Finally, we come to the third point. We have seen the effective cause of our abiding, which is the Holy Spirit in us. We have seen our commanded response, which is that we should abide in Christ. And finally, John tells us about the eternal purpose of our living in Christ, which is that we may have great boldness and confidence on the day of judgment. Did you know there's a day of judgment coming? Verse 28, look with me there. Uh, 1 John 2, verse 28. Here John writes, Now little children abide in him, so that when he, that is Christ, appears, we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, then you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. Again, John uses that term of endearment, technia, little children, and he gives a clear command, abide in Christ, and then he gives us a clear purpose, so that we may have confidence. Now, verse 28 forms a kind of bookend to verse 18. In 18, John says quite plainly that we are in the last hour. And if that was true 1,900 years ago when, G, when John wrote it, it is even more true today. We are skirting along the end of time, beloved. We live at the end of days. And what will the end look like? Well, it will look like, as we see it in verse 28, Jesus appears. Jesus will come in judgment. And the whole world will bow its knee and confess that he is Lord. And his eternal name, Yahweh, will be known and shouted and praised through all the ages by all who belong to him. Men and women will seek to hide themselves from him on that day. They will cry out for the rocks to fall upon them and to hide them from the light of Christ's glory. Loved ones, I dare say if Jesus Christ were to walk into this room right now in his unveiled glory, every single one of us would be hitting the floor and trying to get under the carpet. We wouldn't be able to get low enough to hide from his holiness and his majesty and his glory. That very majestic one is coming back, and when he does, unrepentant sinners will beg to merely tremble. They will hope merely to be afraid. They will seek for mercy, but there will be none. They will cry out for peace and grace, but it will be too late. And graceless, faithless, loveless, without the Spirit, they will go into everlasting punishment with the devil and his angels. That's true. And Christ will reign in righteousness. His coming will be a catastrophe for all who are living outside of him. For all the antichrists who put so much energy and hope in mysteries and prophetic utterances and who have cast out demons and have chased after the anointing through new revelation and who have made a mockery of the Spirit's ministry in the church, their mysteries and revelations will burn with them. Not for those in whom the Spirit dwells. Listen, so that when He appears, we may have Confidence, confidence, boldness, assurance at his coming. Purpose, loved ones, the purpose of abiding in Christ is so that we will be ready on that day. Do we even live in light of that day? Do we live thinking of that coming day? And this is not, as some jokingly say, Jesus is coming back, look busy. We do not joke about the things of God. The ministry of the Holy Spirit in us, by driving us to Christ to gaze upon Jesus, 
to love and obey him and live in him. It is all to make us ready for that for which Jesus died. Did you know that Jesus died to make you ready for that day? Now this whole situation in Ephesus, uh, all these churches to whom John is writing this letter, the whole problem of these antichrists and busybodies and those who have left and those who have stayed, all of it is ultimately bound up in the pressing urgency of the return of Jesus, of the coming judgment. It is a pressing urgency, non-Christian. Believer, you do not have to worry that Christ will overlook you on that day. You don't have to worry that he will forget about you, busy as he is judging the world. How could he forget you having personally anointed you with the Holy Spirit when he gave you new birth? He did that. You are sealed. You have a seal on you. You are marked by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was there. He did that. Meanwhile, live in him. Feed upon his word. Rely upon the spirit to teach you and to strengthen you as you follow Christ. Lean on Jesus for his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Now, of course, you don't want to miss that very important verse 29. If you know that he is righteous, Jesus, if you know that Jesus is righteousness, is righteous, then you know that everyone also who practices righteousness is born of him. Now, this verse might seem at first to be out of place. What does it have to do with what he's just talked about? It may seem like it doesn't fit, but it does fit. How do we know someone is abiding in Christ? What are their telltale signs? Well, it's not those who merely say they abide in Christ. There is no end of those. But it is those whose lives are marked by an increasing pattern of obedience to him and a deepening knowledge of their Lord in the word. Loved ones, those who do righteousness they are the ones who are born of him. And and they'll have no cause to be ashamed of their lives when he comes. They will not hide from him. They will not be the ones hoping that the rocks will fall upon them. No, they will boldly and gladly say, Come, Lord Jesus. They will shout it out. He is here. Jesus is here. Praise God, he's here. What is the pattern of your life? In what direction are you headed? Is not the Holy Spirit speaking to your mind and heart even now, convicting you of sin and righteousness and judgment? And Christian, I would have you leave with joy, empowered, by this knowledge that the Holy Spirit lives in you, even you, to empower your life and to draw you back to the simplicity of Jesus. So Christian, you have the anointing, you have the Spirit, and by the Spirit's power, live in Jesus. 